Hi, everyone. Welcome to the session. Um, I just wanted to mention before we're getting started is that you will need to join uh, the polling session uh, if you are, uh, have not already done so. Um, the poll instructions are here on the slide, going to mcgill.ca slash polling. You'll have to join a session and you will have to log in or sign in with your McGill email address and username. And when you get to that last part, it will ask you for a session ID and the session ID is McGill polling. Um, so we will do our best to, uh, we will give it another minute or so and let people kind of get ready to go if you haven't gotten ready already. Um, but uh, we're only going to be able to do minor amounts of technical support through the process. So just keep in mind. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about in terms of polling, that um, polling for a one-off event, um, using polling at McGill is, is, is stressful. There's a lot of things to get going. But when you're using it for a class and you have a regular connection with your students, once you get past that setup and ready to go, polling just uh, is an easy thing to, to get started with. So um, uh, once everybody has gotten logged in and ready to go, we just want to welcome you to our, our session. My name is Adam Finkelstein from Teaching and Learning Services, and I'm uh, here with Jasmine Parent, who is a, a learning technology consultant here uh, at Teaching and Learning Services. And we're here to talk about engaging students with polling at McGill. Uh, we have a roughly 30-minute session, of course, depending on how the, uh, uh, the questions go as we're going along. Um, so we're very excited to, uh, to let you know. Keep in mind, any ID that you're looking of, the session ID is McGill polling, all in one word. Um, I'll just add that into the chat, McGill polling. Oops, and it would be help if, yeah, there we go. Okay, good. Um, so, you know, one thing we wanted to do is talk to you about polling and some of the ideas around polling. And if we go to our next slide, Jasmine, our maid, uh, in order to do that, what we really want to do is uh, start off with polling. So this is just a first quick question we want to do. It's a rank uh, priority question. If you've joined the session, you will automatically see on your device, either on the web or if you've joined from mobile phones, you will see it uh, um, show up there that you can choose. And you're able to choose um, one, you know, in order uh, how you would get yourself acquainted with new technology, setting up an appointment, reading the manual, opening and playing around, etc. So when you're ready, get going, start to, uh, start to give your responses um, and you will be able to see uh, uh, what's happening. So we're gonna give you a second to respond to the poll. You're gonna see that in your, in your slides. You can pick the order at which you want to respond. And as you can see in our slide in the top right, uh, the participants or the number of participants is climbing. That's basically saying how many people are responding to the poll. Now we may not, in, in a session with your students, you will want everybody or as many people to respond. Given our time, we may not give a huge amount of time for you to respond. Um, if you respond, you just select your answer at the bottom. It'll give you your A, B, or C, and you just click the order at which you want to respond, and you'll be able to uh, answer the poll that's there. Okay, so I'm just going to take a look and scan here. Uh, we've got uh, uh, a couple of questions. Oh, <laughs> slow down from Chantel. Yes, we will slow down um, and, and move into our, uh, our, our, our session for the day. So uh, we're going to close the poll and, and just look at the results here. And it looks like most people uh, are very close to most people. It seems to be a bit of a tie there. Um, and what's really interesting is the percentages. This is one of those things with a, a priority ranking is percentages don't make any sense because everybody's answering uh, multiple options. But don't worry, ignore the percentages. Uh, it does look like right now that most people open it and play it, figure out or read the manual documentation. Great. Thank you for participating. Um, and we'll continue on with our outcomes. And we're going to tell you that the, the whole uh, outcomes around today is one, exploring how polling can be used to increase engagement with students. Second is give you an opportunity to participate in a couple of different polls that we're going to do uh, through the session. And third is kind of identify the next steps. Keeping in mind, everything is documented online. If you go to mcgill.ca slash polling, and I will post that into the chat and allow you to, uh, to continue. Uh, again, we're going to be moving through, so we'll give you as many opportunities as possible, uh, but know that you may miss a few things and you can come back and watch the recording or try experimenting with this on your own as you're moving forward. So one thing we wanted to, to give you is, is the end first. So if we talk about the end first, then the next slide is what are the major benefits of polling? The big benefits of polling you can think about in three major areas. First is increasing engagement. It gets everybody involved. All students have to do something. You're asking questions and you're getting them to respond. So they're not just listening, they're participating and acting uh, within the class. So there's a lot more interest and engagement because everybody likes to respond to, to questions. Uh, um, and it's a, a really fun way to do so. 
Um, the second is, is that you have the ability to do a lot more active learning opportunities within a live session that you're doing with your students. You can, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. And the third is feedback. Not only are students getting feedback, how everybody's responded, but also individual instructors, you're also getting feedback as to how all of the students are responding. So those are the three things that we wanted to talk about. And, and we're going to launch a, a little bit farther. And don't worry, there'll be lots of opportunities for people to uh, uh, respond to the polling. I'm going to hand off to Jasmine, who's going to continue. And I'll keep an eye on the chat uh, uh, with questions as we go. Thank you so much, Adam. So let's talk a little bit about using polling at McGill to increase engagement in your course. So when we compare polling at McGill to the Zoom polling feature, we can see that polling at McGill is a more sophisticated polling system. Um, Zoom is limited to using only multiple choice questions, while polling at McGill has a variety of questions, um, which we're going to explore in a moment. The reporting in Zoom polling is quite basic, which is uh, a simple Excel spreadsheet while the polling at McGill can be used um, for much more sophisticated reporting and analysis, including information on performance and participation. Polling at McGill integrates with PowerPoint, so to allow you to add questions uh, directly into your presentation so that when you pro progress through your lecture, the questions will appear quite seamlessly on the screen. Polling at McGill also has an integration with My Courses, where it will pull your class list into the platform so that when your students join the session in your lecture, Polling at McGill will link their accounts to their name that is found in your class list. This also creates an opportunity to include a grade for participation, which you can link to your grade book. Finally, when you give a poll with Polling at McGill, the poll and the results are captured in the lecture recording. This is not the case for Zoom polling. So it's not to say that Polling at McGill is necessarily better than Zoom polling. Zoom polling does have its place and is really great for very quick, uh, quick engagement opportunities within a live lecture. But Polling at McGill is a really more sophisticated and powerful tool um, to use for different types of engagement and interactive opportunities. So at McGill, we're using a web-based polling system called Turning Point. So when I say polling at McGill or Turning Point, I actually mean the same thing. Um, polling at McGill is McGill's branding to the Turning Point technologies. So this is turning point, the Turning Point interface when you open the application on your computer. Um, we're going to be focusing on using Turning Point um, to produce polling questions within PowerPoint. So what happens is during a class, students respond to live PowerPoint presentation slides using their personal devices, which could be their smartphone, um, their tablet, or their laptop. With, poll, with live polling in PowerPoint, the results are shown in real time. So this is, a, this is great for getting instant feedback, um, checking participate, uh, participant knowledge, and giving everyone a voice. So even in large lectures, it's a way to allow all students to participate. Um, there is Anywhere polling, you can see here in the middle, um, that is the same idea as PowerPoint, but can be used with different applications. If you want to use Anywhere polling, we're going to be providing more resources on that um, in our list that we give with the webinar, the recorded webinar. So there are a variety of ways in which you can use polling in your classes to increase um, active participation of students to support learning. You can use polling to orient your students, to get to know them, um, or orient them to your subject. So you can use polling to inform your students um, or yourself of their learning by giving knowledge, oops, sorry, <laughs> knowledge checks throughout your course. You can also use it for interactive purposes, which we'll be modeling later on in this presentation. And finally, you can use polling to give students an opportunity to, for reflection. So perhaps midway through a course or at the end as a wrap up activity. So there are a few things to consider when using polling. Um, the first is the question type. So Turning Point has quite a few choices when it comes to question type. You might wanna think about um, if you want to have questions with predefined choices, like a multiple choice or a priority ranking or Likert scales type questions, or you might want to include open response questions where students can type in their answers. So like short answer, long answer, or word clouds. And finally, you can have interactive questions which allow students to select a place on an image to respond to a question. So we're gonna show you what that looks like um, later on in the presentation as well. You will also want to consider um, 
when you're going to ask your polling questions. So here's an example of how to time the polling in your course. Um, this is a recommendation of how you might want to structure your content in your polling questions. This is the 10-2 strategy, which is where you give 10 minutes of lecturing and two minutes of interaction. So you give, after you give 10 minutes uh, of lecturing, two minutes of interaction, you can then give another 10 minutes of lecturing and either ask another question or perhaps re-poll the question um, that you asked before to see if the answer has changed based on new information students receive. There are different ways in which you can use polling in your lecture. So do you want your question to be answered individually or do you want to pair it with an active learning strategy like think, pair, share, um, where your students have to discuss their responses and then answer a question. You can also choose to display your results during or after the poll or not at all. And finally, you can choose to set your responses to be anonymous. So this might be interesting if you're asking a more sensitive question um, that students would prefer to answer anonymously. Of course, you can also use identified question types to track participation and attendance. So let's explore the different question types you can use for polling. The Oh, just a reminder, um, I'm going to be asking some interactive questions throughout this part of the lecture. So if you haven't um, joined the polling session, please do so um, at mcgill.ca slash polling. After you log in, the session ID is McGill Polling. So the first way that you can use polling is to orient your students to a course and get to know them. So this is a great way to build community, uh, a sense of community within your remote course. These questions can be used to get a sense of who your students are, maybe their background, their experience, etc. Uh, it also allows students the opportunity, opportunity to get to know their classmates. And you can use this as a time to check in with your students and practice building empathy. Um, there will be students that are going to feel stressed out during these times. Um, most have never taken an online course before. And for first year students, especially, this isn't exactly an ideal way to start university. So using polling to, for purposes that build a relationship with students, asking them how they're feeling might be a nice way to just make them feel a little more comfortable. So I'm going to ask a question here about your experience using polling. So have you ever used polling, clickers, or another student response system before? So the polls are open. I can see here my responses are going up as people respond. I'm gonna pull over the session ID here just in case. So when you give your lectures, you're gonna get a sense of how many students are, are there or how many students are participating. And once you do, you kind of um, know when the time is to close the polls. So I'm just going to give this a few more seconds. All right, 45. That's good. So 35% of you have used um, either polling clickers or student, another student response system as an instructor and as a participant. So that's really great. Um, we have a quarter of you who have never used it. So Moving on, I'm going to ask another question. Are you motivated to use polling at McGill in your remote course this fall? Yes, no, or I don't know yet. Let's see if we can get to 45. That'll be my magic number. Oh, 46. There we go. So yes, most of you are motivated that makes sense why else would you be here nobody is not motivated um, that's good to see um, so in this third slide i'm going to it just takes a second to load there we go in this third slide i'm going to do what's called a demographic comparison um, with your experience level and how you're feeling about using the tool so this is something you can do with your students you might ask them a demographic question at the beginning of a lecture and use um, that question to compare results in subsequent, subsequent questions. You can also do this more than once during the lecture. So the demographic here is your experience, and I can see that those who have, 100% uh, of people who have experienced using polling as an instructor are motivated to, to use it in uh, the remote course this fall. 
The results are kind of mixed for the I don't know yet and those who, for those who have never used it. Or, or, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to jump in, Jasmine, to, to, yeah, to, sure. to add something. What's really great about this demographic polling, and I just want to say how, how powerful this really is an instructional tool. Um, you can create that demographic split at the beginning of your class. So say, okay, we're going to just split, you know, who, who identifies, you know, as male, female, and other, or something like that, as an example, and then store it. And as you go through your session, you can actually keep coming back and doing demographic splits to see. Or, for example, it might be, where are you from in the world? And then do a demographic split. So you can take, essentially, any question and do cross tabs throughout your course as you're going. It's incredibly powerful and an amazing tool to, to see where, uh, uh, how people are responding. Thank you, Adam. So the next um, question type you can use for polling can be used to inform your students by checking their understanding in order to provide feedback or perhaps clarify concepts. So you can check students' understanding of what you've taught or what their knowledge is on a subject that you will be teaching. This also provides opportunities for practice um, of your content. So on the next slide here, I have a hotspot question. Um, when the poll opens, there we go. This is a map that is actually interactive. So you can touch um, the map to indicate your response to the, the question, where is the Indian Ocean? Keep in mind that you can change your response up until I close the poll. So click anywhere, um, you can click in the correct place if you want, but the point is just to, to model what this type of question is like. So let's try and get to 45. Great. So when I close the poll, um, there we go. So you can see that the majority of you got it correct. Um, those that did not, you can see that the little pins are in red. Those that have it within the correct hotspot that I've indicated um, when I created the question, their little pins will be green. So this might be an interesting type of question that you could use for an anatomy course, for example, if you wanna ask students where certain bones are or where certain organs are. The next type, um, are questions that promote peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Um, you can use polling uh, as a springboard for interactivity. So for example, in this next section, I'm going to ask you a question, a question here. So what is the tallest point on earth? Um, I'll give you a few seconds to answer. Is it Mount Everest, Mauna Kea, Mount Kilimanjaro, or Mount Chimborazo? So notice I'm just clicking on the slide to, to, to close the poll. This isn't always the case. This is for a PC. Um, for a Mac, you might have to open and close the poll using this toolbar here. But for me, I'm just clicking through and the poll automatically opens and automatically closes when I click uh, next slide. So Mount Everest, 74% of you have said Mount Everest. Um, before I give you the right or wrong answer, um, this I just want to show you that this uh, could be used as an active learning strategy, like think with an active learning learning strategy, like think pair share, where you answer a question and then I break you up into groups or into a, a breakout room uh, discussion on Zoom, and after a few moments I bring you back in. Um, for now, since we don't have a ton of time, I'm just going to ask you to um, reflect in the chat in the, uh, reflect on the question in the chat. So with that, I want you to think about what it means to be the tallest point on earth. Is it the tallest point from sea level, below sea level, or perhaps from the earth's center? So before I repoll this question, I just wanna have you think about your rationale of why you answered it the way that you did. I'll give that a few seconds. From the base. Summit of Mount Everest is higher above sea level. Tallest from sea level, tallest place from center. So you have different ideas of what the tallest point means. So after reflecting on how you've answered it and maybe reading some of your, your colleagues, I'm gonna re-poll the question. 
and see if your answer has changed after thinking about it, um, perhaps in a different way. Thirty-eight. A few more seconds. Forty-five. Okay, so your answer didn't really change. Um, I think one percent um, changed for for Mount Everest. I went from 60, sixty-six to sixty-seven. Um, the bad news is that I don't have a right answer for you right now because it really depends on where your starting point is. So all of these mountains um, could be considered to have the highest point depending on how you measure highest point. Mount Everest is highest point above sea level. Um, Mauna Kea is highest point when considering its base below sea level and above sea level, uh, its tip above sea level, um, etc. So that's just an interesting um, way that you could, you could use an active learning strategy like Think, Pair, Share. And the responses from the first question to the, when you re-poll it again, may change based on the discussions they have. I'll give this a second. So in this next slide here, I have what is called a comparative link. So between the two, between the two questions that I just asked. So a comparative link can be used to display the results from two separate slides onto one slide. So if you have a question that you ask at the beginning of a lecture, um, and then again towards the end, you can use a comparative link slide to just display the results from each of the question types on the, the same slide. So I had verbally said what the differences were, but here you can actually put it into one slide and reflect on how they might have changed. So the orange is the first slide, the first time I asked it, and then the second slide is in red. Did you have anything to add, Adam? No. Great. So the next and final type of question you can ask can be used to get your students to reflect on their learning and provide you with feedback on your course or teaching. Um, this is a nice way to get your students to your students' perspective on the course, how they might be feeling um, about their learning, and reflect on their understanding of the content. So, for example. Um, here we're going to do a one minute reflection. I'm actually going to cut it down to 30 seconds, um, but I want you to identify one benefit you see with using polling in your course. So this type of question is a word cloud, um, which you're going to see the results in a moment. A word cloud will take the commonly uh, answered words and make a sort of collage with the more frequently used words being bigger and more centered in the collage. So we'll give you a few seconds to actually type out your responses. All right. Wow. <laughs> okay, so this is all over the place, but that's fine. So we can see here that the two main um, words or the most common words that were answered were engagement and interaction. But you can read here, there are all kinds of different uh, responses. So let's move on and talk a little bit about how you can get started with Turning Point. Um, first things first, you must register your account at mcgill.ca slash polling. So we have a step-by-step, -step, uh, we have step-by-step -step instructions here on how to get started with registering and downloading the software. Once you have it set up and installed, um, you can open Turning Point and your PowerPoint and you're, go and you're going to see an interface like this. So you'll see a Turning Point tab here that's added to your PowerPoint tabs. Um, and you can create a new question simply by cl clicking new and selecting the type of question that you wanna create. So this is gonna then create a Turning Point power, uh, a PowerPoint slide that is a Turning Point slide where you insert your question. You'll have a, a little um, window here where you can select different settings depending on what exactly you wanna do with that question.
So things you want to think about um, before the semester starts when getting started with polling is including registering, it includes registering your account and downloading Turning Point. We talked about that onto your hard drive. Once it's uh, installed and you open it with PowerPoint, you can go ahead and create your questions. Um, we highly recommend that you practice running a session before you run it for the first time in your course. You can run a session and practice by yourself with the with your mobile device, with your own phone, um, or you can have somebody from McGill join your session and answer the polling questions as well. So if you had a TA that had some time, um, this might be helpful to have them join the session, answer the questions, so you can just practice and test the system out. Finally, you'll want to inform your students that you'll be using polling in your course. So students can go to mcgill.ca slash polling also, um, where they can register and follow the instructions on getting started for students. We have sample course outline statements on that page too that you can include in your syllabus concerning polling, um, which we will be sharing. Here are some very high level um, steps for running a session whenever you are ready to run one. First, you must open PowerPoint before you open, uh, sorry, open turning point before you open your PowerPoint slides. Um, you won't be able to add turning point slides if you don't launch PowerPoint through the turning point app. You must also create a session ID, which will be unique to your course. So this is how students will join your session. You, you can choose one, as I did at the beginning of this webinar, called McGill Polling, or you can have Turning Point randomize a session ID for you. When you have a session ID, you can run your session and start your presentation. When you're giving a lecture and you arrive at a turning point slide, I've kind of mentioned this before, sometimes the poll will open automatically for your students. Sometimes you will need to open it for them. I think with Max, you need to manually open it for them and close the poll whenever it's done. Um, and finally, after your course, if you're interested in the results, you must save the session. If you try to close PowerPoint, it's gonna prompt you to do so. However, just keep this in mind in case by reflex you click no um, and don't save the session, then you won't be able to see the results for that particular um, class. We have more detailed resources on how to get started um, in the links that we're gonna share. I just wanted to give you an overview of what you might expect when running a session. So what can you do with the results? You can track participation, which is something um, you can set up with Turning Point. So since you can link Turning Point to your course within My Courses, you can then upload participation points directly into your gradebook. Um, in my courses. Second, uh, the results might, be, might also be helpful to identify problem areas. So after a lecture, you can take a closer look at them and perhaps see where students might be having some misunderstandings, which you can then further clarify in the next lecture. And finally, as I said previously, you can use it to collect feedback and check in with your students. So you can insert uh, a written response question that's anonymous and actually ask students to write a little bit about how they're feeling generally or maybe uh, about your course. Um, and you can, or you can use different learn, active learning strategies like the one minute reflection that we did with the word cloud, but for a longer response type question. If you do resp a written response type question, the results do not get displayed on the screen, but will be saved um, as a part of your session report, which you can look at after your course. So I'm going to pass the conclusion on back to Adam. Thanks, Jasmine. And, and I think thanks for a, a whirlwind tour of interesting and fun things you can do with. Uh, with <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I, I think, you know, one of the difficult things is always gauging a, a complexity. And I, and I think this is a great example where, you know, there's a big difference between a webinar and a class. And one of the big differences is that in a class, you have a repeated sessions over time. So one of the things in, and one of the reasons why you see a lot of the times we're not necessarily using uh, polling at McGill in some of the other webinars we've done is because, you know, there's, there's some logistics to get things going and get things started. Um, so one thing we could have done, I guess, at the beginning of all of our, our sessions at the curriculum is got people started and use it all the way through. And that's something we can think about for the future, because it really is a much more sophisticated and powerful system to do. Um, and just to sort of to wrap ourselves up again uh, uh, in the end is thinking about there are obviously lots of great examples of using polling for engagement, getting students involved, excited, um, interactive. I mean, I could just see from the chat, a lot of you were really involved and lots of questions and everybody's in pushing the buttons and trying to do things. 
things. Uh, but of course, one of the other differences between a webinar and your class is that we didn't necessarily wait very long either. We're going to move on to another example. So we're going with like a 60% response. You might wait and say, you know what, I'm going to wait for 80% or I want to wait for as many po as possible to respond to questions that I'm doing. Um, the second is really, of course, the opportunities to do active learning. Very similarly, what you're doing in the physical classroom, you can do online in a polling session. You can have a, an idea, you can have people break out into rooms if you're using Zoom breakouts, or just have actually a discussion in the chat like we did about a question. What do you think is the answer? What do you think is the issue? Do a poll, repoll, et cetera. And the last is, of course, the feedback. And that's what's really critical, where you're getting feedback on the responses. You can save all of these, these responses. You can go back afterwards, look at what individual students looked at. You can run reports. There's a huge level of sophistication behind the scenes that you can do as you go um, that really gives students opportunities uh, to get you to, you to get opportunities for feedback from students as well as students getting feedback themselves. So when they're answering questions and they're seeing, oh, I was on the right track or, oh, I got to say my answer. I got to give my input. It really allows that interaction to go to a next level and not just have a uh, a presentation, but, but at least sort of mimic similar things that we're doing in class. The other thing that's not stated there that I, that I really want to mention too is that if you used a turning point, and we've had it for a couple of years, if you've used it in the live classroom in your last uh, couple of iterations of the course, you can still do exactly the same kind of thing you were doing before. It all runs on the web. It all makes it easy for students to access. So you don't have to have the physical classroom to actually do polling. You can actually translate it really well. So it's a huge bonus uh, for that as well. So, so I think we want to kind of wrap it up up there and, and open it up to some any further questions that you might have. Keeping in mind at the next slide, we want to remind you of all of the webinars that are out there. You can check that on our, our, our webinars page. Um, in addition uh, uh, to those webinars, we have lots of other support support. You will see the access to the recording for this session online, as well as the links that we discussed, uh, uh, the Jasmine discussed as well in the session. Keeping in mind, almost everything is available at mcgill.ca slash polling. Everything's there. Um, now, of course, there are lots of going to be questions about getting started, installing, etc. That's not something we're going to show or cover today. Um, we want to just get you going, get you excited, look at some options, experiment and, and ex uh, uh, experience polling uh, as a student. So let's just go, uh, wanted to go to some of the questions. Uh, uh, Jasmine, do you see any ones that are flying by that are worth talking about? So one of yeah. the ones I keep seeing about is this PowerPoint. So maybe do, do, do you, actually, maybe you can answer that. There's, there's a lot of questions about integrating with PowerPoint, not using PowerPoint, da, 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 that sort of thing. Do you think maybe you could discuss the, why we would you want to use the PowerPoint version? Why would we want to? Um, <laughs> I, well, you can use anywhere polling if you choose not to use PowerPoint. Like somebody had asked if you could use it with Keynote. Um, and yes, you can. So you would just select when you when you launch a turning point, you'd select anywhere polling instead of the PowerPoint integration. Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that, <laughs> Adam. If uh, if there's any more benefit to using it, it did with notice we noticed like it was it was really pretty seamless on your end, like yeah. you were actually running multiple windows. There weren't like a huge cognitive load on your side when you were actually. Yeah. Once you set everything up, it just sort of ran slide by slide and moved forward, at least from, from the sort of participant perspective. Yeah, for sure. It's more streamlined. I mean, you have everything in one place. If you're using Anywhere Polling, you're going to have that application plus whatever other presentation tool that you're using. So that is a good point. Um, everything's in one place. Somebody I, I, asked. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just somebody asked about a an app. So yes, there is a turning point app. Um, that's very useful for students to know, especially um, they can log in through the web and join a polling session as you did. But if they have the turning point app, they could just search it in their in their whatever type of phone they have their app store. Um, the turning point app, you open it and it prompts you right away to to join a polling session. This is once you've registered and have it associated to your McGill account. But it's a really easy way. To, to use uh, turning point at, from the student side. And, and I think that, that that's a good point, you know, like and uh, uh, the app, you know, like I have the app running next to me as an example, you know, and it's nice because, you know, the polling's closed when it's closed and when it's open, it's open. So it sort of keeps your, you know, you divert your attention to doing the poll and then you go back to whatever else you might be doing as well. And, and I think, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about um, uh, uh, we talked a lot about the issues around the difference between Zoom polling and polling at McGill. Again, Zoom is basic. It's simple. You just want to throw a question. That's it. And you can only do a simple multiple choice. You can't do any of the, all the really interesting things we just did cannot be done with Zoom. So if you really just want to ask a question once and you're done, 
Zoom is easy. It's great. It's simple. But if you really want to do something sophisticated and really fun and, and get really engage your students with lots of different types of questions, uh, lots of different opportunities to polling, repolling, looking at data, polling is really the route to go. The other question that, that's come up a couple of times is like, can you do polling in an asynchronous way? Well, that's actually what the survey tool and the quiz tool in my courses is for. Polling is, generate, is, is, is really set up for live. It's meant for live to get live responses, live feedback, live results, live everything. Um, it's, it's really a fixed strategy. It's not a flexible strategy polling. If you want to talk about flexible strategies and being able to survey students and do questions and polling, that's what the quizzes and surveys tool are. Um, and I would suggest you come to the, the assessments workshop, which is actually tomorrow, um, that really talks a bit more about assessments inside uh, my courses for that. Um, so uh, uh, I'm just looking to see, are there any other sort of questions that people, uh, people have uh, uh, related to uh, our, our content here? Um, there was one earlier, any advantage to using the chat in Zoom versus messaging in Turning Point? I'm not sure if you had answered that, Adam, there, but from, from um, in my own opinion, I would, I would use Zoom. Um, sometimes I find the messaging in Turning Point can be a little distracting from your slides when you're trying to run a session and talk to people at the same time. Um, if you have Zoom open in another uh, in another window, um, I just find it a little bit easier to manage. Plus, it's saved. I don't know if you can save the chat in Turning Point. So I think uh, viewing restrictions and um, oh, uh, viewing restrictions in the lecture recording. Okay. Um, that I'm, I'm not sure, Tamara, if I'm getting your question, but one thing that is a big downside with the Zoom polling is that the poll and the responses and the graphs are not included in the class recording. In the recording you're doing, the polling in Zoom does not show up. Um, so it, it's just the way it's set up. There's nothing anybody can do about it. So that's yet another reason why if you really want to do some sophisticated polling, you're going to have to look at a, um, the polling at McGill as an example. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind. And the program, Jill, does work just the same on a PC and Mac. There's some small limit, you know, small changes. For example, you have to start the poll on a Mac and you don't have a PC. But for the most part, it's completely set up cross-platform and you can do just about anything, uh, uh, anything uh, um, with both uh, tools. That's there. Somebody had asked earlier during the presentation, um, what is the hotspot option? So the hotspot option is really, really easy to set up. Um, when, you, when you have the turning point open in your PowerPoint and you click on new uh, question, you can select hot, hotspot and all you do is upload an image. You upload an image, you can indicate where the correct, um, the correct answer is on the image, but you don't even have to do that. Um, it's as easy as that. And, and, I, and I think a lot of people can think of, imagine how useful that can be in any courses that involve images or things like that, like identification of plants or looking at a, a map or, or looking for areas that you want people to do. And you saw from the results, it gives a really nice sort of spread of green and red, like were you in the right hotspot as an example. Um, and those are, again, really nice interactive questions that you can do. One question we didn't do that's kind of similar to that is that instead of words as choices in multiple choice, you can actually use images. So okay. it's another thing we didn't, we didn't show that because it's the same kind of question as a multiple choice. But instead of ABCD being words, ABCD are different images. So you could say, what spe you know, identify the plant that is species X, and you could have four plants and people pick the plant. So again, you have way more sophistication that you can do to really engage students in the types of questions that you're asking. Um, is the world map a TP standard? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, I don't think the world map is a TP standard, Jasmine. Did that come from clip art or something? That was a good question. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I really didn't look into uh, much about the image. I think I just selected it off a Creative Commons site. Yeah. Um, there's there's so there's lots of opportunities for free images that you can check yeah. out on the web as well for anything that you might be doing or any image that you basically post and paste into PowerPoint you can use. All right, so Ken's gonna go find an image from from one of his uh, past sessions maybe or a past lecture on uh, uh, on physics that I know about. Um, there are image banks. You can actually look at the library. Uh, if you go to the Li McGill Library site, they're going to have access to image banks, including ones that are authorized through McGill Library, like uh, art. So there's a lot of stuff that's authorized through the McGill Library that you can't necessarily get free online that we have access to at McGill. Again, that's a library question. Definitely go to the library. Uh, um. Also, it, it, she asked if it's, uh, is there an image bank with Turning Point? So there, 
There isn't one with Turning Point, but you can also get Creative Commons images with PowerPoint. Um, when you go to insert an image, you can click on online images and just select Creative Commons license to make sure that you're allowed to use it. And you can use it um, using PowerPoint, not necessarily Turning Point, but it's all in the same place. And somebody, and, and Tamara was asking about where links to uh, issues around copyright or issues around where the images are. Go to our content webinar that was done earlier in the week and look at the resources and you'll see the link is actually there in, in the resources. So you, you should be able to find that there. Um, okay, so, so I guess one thing we wanna ask is now we're gonna use a Zoom feature because we're gonna do it quickly on the fly is use the green check or the red X uh, that you see on your participants. Um, to just say, you know, like, uh, was, you know, green or red, was this helpful for you today to give you some indication of decisions that you might want to make uh, in using something like polling? Um, do you feel like you've been able to at least get yourself started? So we just wanted to do a quick sort of uh, double check on that. All right, at least a good chunk of you uh, seem to be well on your way. That's great. And some have uh, even given the little virtual claps. That's always very nice. Thank you for the virtual claps. Um, again, it, it's, a, it's a fast moment. It's meant as a lunchtime get started. Um, and uh, this is the first one we've done. We're going to be doing this again, I believe, in a, a week or so, uh, maybe a week or two. Uh, again, you'll be able to access the recording online where all of our webinars are. Uh, and, uh, and be able to see the recording, uh, maybe you know, slow us down, speed us up, depending on what you want to do uh, in the particular session. Um, we're happy to take uh, any further questions for the next uh, minute or two. Um, but other than that, you know, I wanted to thank you, thank Jasmine, thank everybody for engaging. Uh, it's, uh, like I said, uh, um, probably the first time we've really done a full-blown turning point session, uh, uh, polling session with everybody virtually, um, yeah. and happy that you were able to experience that with us. <laughs> Yeah, we usually give a, a workshop on this and it's a little bit different. It's a different experience uh, being in person and helping people get set up. For yeah, and I, and it, it's funny because it's, you know, a lot of people talking about remote transition for teaching in the fall. We've had to do all of our faculty development in remote transition ways too. So we always struggle with different ideas and the same kind of things that you are all struggling with, we struggle with too about how we do certain things and how we make certain things interactive. Uh, um, and I think it's, uh, it's interesting and, and glad you were part of the journey with us today. So, um, so thanks for, again, I think we'll probably sort of to sign off, but we can stick around. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, we're happy to do so. So thanks again for engaging um, and uh, thanks for attending today. <laughs>